Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Marie Hamora, and um, I'm the founder of Cinema Sala, which is a screening workshop uh, series. Sorry, it's a screening workshop series. I'm a little nervous today. Uh, that showcases Filipinx works from the film and performing arts industries. Um, happy Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and welcome to the first ever Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival virtual showcase presented by Visual Communications. From celebrating our histories and cultures to mobilizing our communities to be socially and politically active, we present the virtual showcase to keep us connected during this time. This showcase is brought to you by our partners at Comcast NBC Universal, Sony Pictures Entertainment, Nielsen, HBO and Warner Media, National Geographic. And for more information, please visit vcmedia.org. Org. Today, I am so pumped because Cinema Sala presents Cine Diaz, a fireside chat with filmmaker Ramona Diaz, legendary, legendary filmmaker. Um, I'm going to read you her impressive bio before I, I open it up to her. Ramona S. Diaz is an award-winning filmmaker whose films have screened at Sundance, Berlinale, Tribeca, Viennale, IDFA, and all of her feature-length films, which are Imelda, Don't Stop Believing, Every Man's Journey, Motherland, have broadcast on either POV or independent lens on PBS. She is a current recipient of a Women in Sundance Fellowship and a Chicken and Egg Pictures Breakthrough Filmmaker Award. Diaz was awarded in a prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship and was inducted into the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in 2016. Hi, Ramona. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Cinema Sala. It's such an honor for you to be here. No, this is great. Thank you. Thanks for ha having me. This will be fun. Um, yes, I've uh, followed your career ever since I saw Imelda in the Philippines in the cinema in 2003 and um, in, in your films ever since. And I love right. starting um, these conversations with um, like your origin story. Like, um, so how did you know you wanted to become a documentary filmmaker? You know, I started to, in the beginning, I wanted to do fiction, actually. So I went to film school. I went to film school and went through film history and thought, you know, I'm going to do fiction. After school, I went, um, I was in Boston, then I 
um, I moved to LA and was a production assistant on Remington Steel. I'm dating Ooh. myself. Yeah. <laughs> I like that show. That was like, that was like the job right out of college, which was kind of, it was a really cool job because I thought all jobs were like that. You know, you got, you get hiatus. It's like summer, summer months. And um, uh, in order for us to stay, uh, to stick around the EP of um, the executive producer of Remington Steel, of Steel would like pay us under the table and we would get unemployment. It was like, uh, it was like this sort of um, fun, right? And you would like work in this, on this yacht for rewrites and stuff. I'm like, oh my God, I love working. This is like, this is the best. But then like everything else, um, it ended. Uh, I think Pierce Brosnan wanted to be Bond. So the show ended. And then that was around like 86, 87. And that was when, you know, um, People Power happened right after People Power. And I was hearing a lot of things happening in Manila. I thought, wow, it would be really interesting to go back to see, right? Because after years of repression and suddenly everyone was, was being creative and inventive. And um, I just wanted to see what it was like. So I went back um, to Manila thinking I was gonna stay a year. And I ended up staying four years, four or five years. It's really exciting. And that's when I think uh, my, my love for the documentary form took root. Um, I got involved with um, Apopai Patisa Timbapa, which was about OFWs. We toured the world interviewing OFWs. With, that was by, um, with Monique Villonco. Um, but after that, I knew I, I, I didn't have the skills. You know, I, I just knew I, I needed to learn more. So I left to do grad school a documentary film program, went back to the States and did that and and then stayed and then did Imelda right after grad school. That's So Imelda was the, um, how did you know that she was going to be the subject of the first feature documentary you would make? Well, I, was, I did a thesis film for my grad, for, uh, for grad school, right? And it was really, um, it was about the middle-class women who participated in the people power revolution. I wanted to see through middle-class women who had uh, everything to lose, right? They were very silent until they were not silent, right? They turned a corner and they came out in droves. Through their eyes, I told the, the story of the people power revolution. And then I wanted Imelda in it because, you know, how can you not have, how can you tell that story without Imelda in it? And I thought, you know, why not? I'm gonna just ask. And uh, what I did actually was I cornered Bong 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 in a cocktail party because someone told me just crash and give him that th this letter. So I did. I called him. I'm like, you know, Bong, I really want your mother in this film. Blah blah blah. I gave her. I gave him the the letter. I thought, okay, I, I've done what I could, and let's see. He might give it. He may not. And literally the last day, the, like the day before we were about to wrap, her assistant called and said, you know, Mrs. Marcus has. Um, just came from hospital, but you can come and ask, you know, you have 15 minutes with her, but you can't ask her about the revolution. And I'm like, well, my film's about the revolution, but, but if you have 15 minutes with Mrs. Marcos, you take it, who cares, right? Of course we're gonna be there. So we, we did, and we were there for like five, six hours. She would not stop talking. Wow. And she brought up the revolution. So when she brought it up, I thought it was fair game, right? She brought it yes. up and I could then, you know, pursue it and engage. Um, and then I knew. I mean, you know, you know, right? It's, uh, documentaries, uh, you cast documentaries. You know intuitively who um, the camera loves and who loves the camera, right? I mean, yeah. she certainly loves the camera and the camera loves her back. So I knew, and I asked her there and then, you know, I said, Miss Marcos, I think I should make a film just about you. Through your eyes, what happened? She goes, Iha, that's such a good idea. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, Mrs. M. And then of course it took me a while to graduate, raise the money, and then I went back and, you know, that, that was it. That is amazing. From that one experience, you already like knew what your next project would be. So after you graduated and you came and you raised the money, how, cause you, I remember you shot this on Super 16. Um, yeah. Cause I remember watching it in the cinema. It looks so great because I knew it was filmed. How many days did you have access to her? And you had such amazing access to her. So it was over a period of two years. So whenever when we were with her, we were with her like um, for a month, intensely every day for a month. And we would have rolls of film. And it was this joke on set. It's like, okay, we wrap when we run out of film. Really, right? We leave again, we come back with rolls of film. And then we'll just keep on doing that until the budget can't stretch anymore. And we're really out of film. So that's what we did over 
two years or like three trips. And in those like in those months, she would invite us to um, down south, like there, right? To her to Tolosa, to her beach house, beachfront property, which is no longer theirs. I think it was sequestered. But we would stay there with her, you know, we would, um, so when we would wake up and she was there, we would sleep and she'd still be like talking. I mean, she had more energy than we, the crew did, which is really insane. Um, but the first time I met her for prep, for prep, I was pregnant. I was oh, pregnant wow. with my daughter. And that was right, right after, that was right after I did grad school and my early days, like talking to her and prepping. It was a prep shoot, I remember. And I'll never forget this. Okay, so we were in Leyte. We were in Leyte. Um, and she said, I said, Miss Marcus, I need to sleep because I'm so sleepy. You know when you're pregnant, you're so sleepy. I'm like, so sleepy, Miss Marcus. I need to sleep. She goes, yeah, of course you should sleep because you're pregnant, blah, blah. So I went. I went, slept, and 6 a.m. in the morning, she knocks on my door with breakfast, okay? <laughs> and fully quaffed and, and made up. And I'm like, oh, my God. I said, I should really remember this. She goes, Iha, wake up. Because, you know, it's 6 o'clock in the morning. You should have breakfast. So she, like... <laughs> She started me breakfast event. I mean, this is freaky. I this is like one for the book. So that was my that's my email. And many more. I have many more stories, but that's how sort of the early part of our sort of um, you know, relationship having to do with the film. Do you um what was her reaction when the film came out? How did she yeah, what was her reception of it? So, you know, we would have this uh, phone calls, um constantly, it was this regular phone call and she would call me like at three in the morning, four in the morning, she didn't really uh, take heed of the time difference. So we would constantly have a conversation. So by the time we locked picture and we were done and we were finishing, racing for Sundance because it premiered at Sundance, um, I sent, um, I think she saw it. She saw it through some circuitous way and I found out she saw it and um, we had a call again, one of those 3 a.m. calls, and she went through it. I said, you know, Mrs. Marcus, that was a courtesy screening. Um, you understand? She didn't really have any complaints. She complained about the couturier or saying that women went blind. That was the only thing. She didn't mind anything else but that. So she was fine. And then I invited her to Sundance. She said it was too cold to go to Sundance. So it was fine. Everything was fine. Then fast forward. Like um, six months later, we were out in theaters. We were at the film forum. So the New York Times reviewed it. So did Washpo, so did LA Times because we had a theatrical release, right? And then they called her, you know, they called her a pariah or crazy or, and then suddenly she saw herself through the um, eyes of reviewers and she minded that very much. So she sued us. She had a restraining order in the Philippines. She sued me and my distributor. Wow. Was you yeah. yeah, that's crazy, yeah. Yes, I have the DVD released by Unitel. I own it. <laughs> yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, she sued uh, Unitel and me. I had to fly and uh, I was in court. I had to defend the film. Yeah, but we won, you know. I mean, uh, her. I think her claim was invasion of privacy and selling her good name, which, you know, kind of hard to make that case. And she's a public figure and she signed a release. And, you know, we were legally, it was all, you know, planchado for us you know I was so secure but we still had to, to go through the motions because she you know she took us to court um I have a million more questions about this film but I do want to ask about your other films so I'm going to move on uh, uh okay. to your other films so um I I also watched a uh, rewatch uh, Don't Stop Believing Every Man's Journey and um it was this wonderful like like they call it a Cinderella, like kind of a fairy tale story, which I, I agree. But and but I wanted to know what was the impetus for this? What did you hear about the news and decide to follow, follow Arnell? Did they approach you? Um, and how long were you following him as well? Um, so I was finishing the learning. After Imelda, I did the learning. And I was finishing that and I got this sort of this viral email written by the consul, the American consul in the Philippines, in the American embassy in the Philippines. So he's, he wrote about how Arnell had to sing for his visa. It was such a funny, funny, funny email. And uh, it was sent to me. And then I sent it to Peter McHugh, who's like uh, my manager in Los Angeles. I said, Peter, read this. It's really funny. Someone should make this film. And then he gave it, sent it back. He goes, you should make this film. I said, no, 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 no. I was just sued by Mrs. Marcos. I do not like famous people. 
I'm like, and then I knew also the music, music would be hellish, right? Music rights. Goes, no, 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 you really should. You really should. So one thing led to another. And before he, he called their manager and the manager called. And before I knew it, I was on a phone call with their manager. And the manager said, let me ask, you know, because I pitched it first time, you know, for, first year with the band and what is he going to do? Fish out of water, blah, 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 blah. And he goes, okay, I'll pitch it. He pitched it to the boys, to, you know, the founders, so the journey members. And they came back and said, no, you know, I think next year. You can film next year. I said, no, 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 Next year, you don't have a story. This year, you have a story. So I said, so I made a deal with them. I said, give me five days with you guys and I'll cut something and I'll prove to you you have a story. And they agreed. So we went there. We shot for like five, three, less than five days. I think three days over the weekend. They were practicing in Northern California with Arnell. First time I met Arnell as well. And then we cut a trailer. We sent it. We sent it to Irving Azoff, the big music agent, his wife saw it, Irving's wife cried. And Irving's wife said, you must tell the boys to do this. And that's how it was. And then we didn't have money, but that's a whole other thing. We had to raise money really quickly because they were going on the road. We didn't know, we didn't think they'd say yes, right? So it's just one of those things. And I wanted to do it because I really liked her now. When I met him, I really felt like, you know, this is a story to tell. And I, 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 I don't see it as fully a Cinderella story, which is interesting because when I show it in Europe, especially in France, they see it very differently, you know, than American audiences. How do the French see it? Well, they see it as uh, someone who's trapped because he can't um, express his own music. You know, so like a meta cover I, see, right? I see that. But I mean, I, I got that through line, but in the end, when they when you when you have the the text that says that he's on the new album and he collaborated on songs, yeah. you think that, that that that's kind of like the hope of that. But that's very interesting that the French take away that. that yeah, that, French that, and Moroccan, a- Moroccan, uh, the Moroccans see it the same way. We, I screened it in Morocco as well. It, it's really interesting. You know, it's it's cultural. You know, through cultural biases and through the prism of, um, uh, you know, um, yeah, different cultural lenses, you see it differently. It's, it's just really interesting. Um, I also want to talk about Motherland um, because um, that's another film that was very surprising because it, it was usually in the films, uh, in your previous films, like you would follow a few characters, but this one was a really amazing ensemble. Um, and you really got a slice of life in this uh, uh, hospital ward. For those who haven't seen it, I want them to see it. So I want you to tell the audience, whoever hasn't seen it, what the film is about. So the film is about one of the busiest maternity hospitals in the world, uh, which happens to be in Manila, the Fabella um, uh, Memorial Hospital. Uh, I think they... um, they have they deliver like a hundred babies for twenty four hours, so they're the bus- busiest. They claim in the world, but certainly in the region, right? And uh, the impetus for that is I wanted to look at reproductive health and reproductive justice in the Philippines. I always start with a theme in my head, and that's a, that's a theme that was in my head. And then someone told me to visit Fabella, and I did. I visited Ward Four, and I was like, "This is where my film is. My film lives within these four walls and nowhere else." What so made you say the, that? Like, what were the things that you saw that made you say that? Okay, so uh, I would, I walked around, I sat on the beds of these women, and I listened to their conversations. And they didn't even care I was there. And they were amazing, funny conversations. I'm like, oh my God, right? So I wanted to cover that, those fleeting relationships between women in this situation, it's very intense, you know, when they're there, they've just given birth, their hormones are flaring, they share everything from breast milk to, to load, you know, the phone load. <laughs> you would know that. So, I mean, they shared everything, their troubles, their uh, problems with their spouses, their partners, whatever, but it's fleeting, right? Because when they leave, you know, they'll never see each other again, but they make plans. To me, that's so, there's something about that that's so precious. And so that's what I wanted to capture. And, um, and based off of that, then you can, we can still examine reproductive health and reproductive justice for sure in those women's stories. So um, that's what I saw. And that's what I said, okay, this is it. And so it's a purely, purely observational film. There is no, there are no interviews. No one talks to the camera. We really are just invisible 
people bearing witness to women in this situation. And that's what I wanted. That's that that to me is a form I've always wanted to do. So it's like that's a for me film, right? I, I'm so happy we were able to pull it off. Um, one of the, I mean, there are many things I love about this film, but one of the things I really love are are the transitional devices of the um, the the what do you call it? Like the the speaker, like the, the there's like a nurse who does announcements, yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. like stand up comedy. It is basically, and yeah, and it's it's quite wonderful like it's yeah. did you have how many hours of footage did you have and had to whittle that down into your film so if that was the shortest shooting period i've ever had we shot for six straight weeks so basically the idea was i i i filmed i followed four women who maybe four six maybe a little bit over i feature four in the film but i think i followed six and basically um uh what happened uh, yeah, so I, I wanted women who gave birth prematurely, because if you give birth to a healthy baby, you're in and out in 24 hours. So there is no story there. So if you give birth prematurely, you're there over um, six weeks, uh, five to six weeks, give or take. So I chose women who gave birth prematurely and to premature babies. So um, I so within intake and uh, discharge, basically, that was our container of the film. So every day, 16 hour days, I don't know how many, uh, you know, much less than my latest film, you know, cause that was only, that was the same amount of time, but I had two crews on the ground and we shot, I don't, I don't know, we shot, we shot a lot. But so here it was even more contained. We cut that in like seven months and um, which is not a lot, right? Usually it's a nine, 10 months I should, um, post schedule. It was um, easiest to cut actually. Uh, you lead me to my uh, next question, which is your relationship with Leah Marino, who I've noticed is the editor of all your films. Yeah. And I wanted to know um, how did you find each other and what is your process with each other? Because you have such a, like an, like, yeah, like a committed like collaboration. Yeah, it's a mind meld with Leah. Um, so she cut, when she, when I met her for Imelda, she was also emerging, right? So she was learning the avid <laughs> as, as we cut Imelda. And I was also learning. So we were learning together in Austin because I was living in Austin then. So I was introduced to her in Austin. So we both, we sort of learned through Imelda what to do and how to do this. And it just happened that we really got along, you know? I mean, she knows, she doesn't speak the language though, which is really interesting. But she, but because most of my DPs don't, and I like that because then it's visually driven as opposed to um, audio driven, you know, when they shoot. And so it's Leah. Leah knows the cadence now of the language. So when she cuts it, it's almost too, it's almost right to the syllable. It's really freaky, although she doesn't speak it. Um, so our process is, we, we sort of, I, I make my own golden moments. Like I know which things I want in the film. She has her own stuff. She insists on watching everything, which I give her. If that's her process, that's her process. So I give her that. And then we come together and we just start. I always believe in starting um, with the thing you love best, not in the beginning necessarily, because otherwise you'll never start. So the most yummy scene that you, you, you want to start with, start there and then build it out. Like that. So that's how we build out. She starts somewhere, what she see, you know, a scene she really loves, she starts there. And I tell her this scene is really, really yummy. You should do that. And then we put it up on the wall and it's like a puzzle. And she already knows, she knows my tastes and sensibilities and we're all, we're so on the same page. So it's great. I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky to have her really. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. I, I, I wish, I mean, like I, we have, I, I, I edit too, but I understand, I know how hard it is to edit a documentary and wading through that footage and having that mind meld is so, is so precious. And I actually have a question, a thousand cuts, uh, later on, I will bring it up. I have, uh, my, my question is you have a wonderful, magnificent track record of getting into the best film festivals and securing film financing from the most prestigious um, organizations. And a lot of our audiences, uh, our audience is uh, filmmakers like who are trying to make it to these film festivals and, and financial institutions. So what advice would you give them um, in terms of how they should position their work or strategize so that they can have 
the same trajectory or a chance in the in these places? I always say meet people, meet them, meet the funders in person. I know it takes resources to get to that festival, but say you live in San Francisco, attend the San Francisco International Film Festival, know who's coming in, do your homework and make it a point to meet them. Because at the end of the day, I think funders like people who they met and they know they can get away along with, right? So when you like submit something, it's no longer cold. You can always refer to, remember we sat down for coffee at the San Francisco, whatever. There's something there that you can refer to. But I think you should do your homework. If there is a film festival close to you, you can drive to, uh, go. Right. And if uh, sometimes sometimes industry don't come. Right. But there are other filmmakers that you can hang out with, find out and they can introduce you to other filmmakers. It's really a community. It's a very small community. The documentary community is what I'm talking about. It is very small, really. At the end of the day, everyone sort of knows each other. But that's because there are these festivals and they really become community places of community that you should really just show up show up at the festival, show, you know, if there's a panel in town, go to the panel. If there's a talk, go to the talk, you know, even if you don't know the filmmaker, you, you're, you know, the, the film sounds weird, go, because you'll never know. You'll never know if maybe you love the film, right? So if there's a chance to watch a film that you would otherwise not see, and the filmmaker is speaking, go, just go, like, just really be vigilant and meet the programmers as well. Cause you'll have a chance to meet the programmers if, if you go to place, if you show up, just show up. I think that's extremely valuable <laughs> information. And I mean, granted, you know, we live at a time where film festivals have been oh, canceled, yeah. Yeah. but you know, when once things are up and running again, I feel that um, that would be valuable. In this time when we all have to uh, distance ourselves and be at home. Is there a way for people to meet um, programmers where, um, you know, is it something where you dive into the organization's websites and find out who's in charge of certain things and how can you do it while we're apart? Okay, so a lot of the programmers and funders and film festivals have online things like this, right? Um, they're doing a lot of online programming. So you just have to find out. And, and if like, um, if you're not a, an alum, everyone want, needs now to be an alum of certain things. If you're not, but you wanna still be included in the Zoom call or whatever, I suggest you call and say, I'm not an alum, but I wanna be, and I really just wanna listen. And I think people these days are very generous, right? They're, they're all about collaborating and really helping independent filmmakers survive, right? And so it, it is a very, Everyone is in a very generous mood. So I, I would say, figure out what's going on online, attend those things. It doesn't now take you anything, right? You're in front of your computer, you just attend um, and find out what's going on. And that's a, you know, that's a way to, I think, meet people. I do believe that, you know, uh, film festivals will, will happen again, some two, two and a half, who, who, who knows, right? Uh, it'll change, it'll have to change. It has to be more equitable the structure has to change, I think. Something has to give because it is not equal, right? Even in our world, who gets to do what and who gets to attend and who gets to be seen. So, uh, so yeah, so that that's a conversation we should all be having as a group, not in silos. It's happening yeah. now that we're all in silos, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, we have a question from our audience. Amanda B has a question for you, which is, do yeah. you start with a script, Ramona? Uh, I start with um, a one pager, two pager. So I don't really have a script in documentary. Uh, of course, now I'm doing a fiction. Of course, that that's different. But for documentaries, no. I do have um, a concept. Usually it's a couple pages. But I do start with the bigger theme. Because at the end of the day, what is it about? The what is it about question that funders, investors, you know, always ask. That thing that it's about has to be big, that has to transcend time, right? That thing has to be evergreen, right? So if you're making a film about Fobelia maternity hospital, what is it about, right? Reproductive justice. And then when they hear that, then it feels like, oh, it's big. Like reproductive justice will still be relevant, well, hopefully not as relevant, but in 10, 20 years, right? 
or community of women or motherhood. It has to be, you have to transcend the specifics of the story when they ask, what is it about, right? You don't go into the weeds of the story. You give them the big picture and then you say, okay, what will happen? What, you know, what are we going to see? Then that's the time to tell your story. So with your latest film, A Thousand Cuts, Ramona, what is the bigger theme and what is it about? <laughs> the bigger, it's uh, press freedom, right? And disinformation at a time of um, uh, growing authoritarianism. Uh, my, I wanted to make a film about Duterte, really, about the drug war, because I, um, I was finishing Motherland and on my Facebook feed were all these horrific photographs from the drug war, from Rafi Lerma, et cetera. And I'm like, oh my God, you can't turn your, uh, you can't turn away, right? And I said, I, I really need to see what this is all about and stuff. So that's what started it for me. So something to do with Duterte and authoritarianism and drug war and stuff turned into a thousand cuts, which is now press freedom and disinformation, but still under Duterte, still under authoritarianism and uh, uh, weaponization of the law. Really. And, and speaking of, you know, all those themes, we do have a special guest today, which I'm super excited to bring in uh, with us. And um, um, Ryan, could we bring Maria Ressa in, please? Um, because she is the, what, the main subject of um, Ramona's documentary. Welcome. Uh, Miss Ressa, it's an honor <laughs> to be with you. Call me Maria, please. I'm sorry. Like I've been watching you on CNN since I was a child, and so I'm not. <laughs> I, I, so I'm just like I'm a very big fan, um, and I'm very very honored that you are here and you made some time today to to call in from the Philippines. Um, I, the first thing I want to ask uh, Maria is that you know um, I I have grown up as I mentioned I've grown up seeing you on the news. And you did mention this in A Thousand Cuts, but for those who haven't seen it because it's not yet publicly uh, released yet, um, I wanted to know, I uh, wanted you to share why you decided to first return to the Philippines to cover the news. You know, it was really an accident. I had a, after I graduated college, uh, I uh, knew that I wanted to go back home. Right. Actually, I wanted to try to figure out where home was. Ramona and I have talked about this a lot uh, because when you're Filipino American, you never feel one thing like when I, I feel most American when I'm in the with Filipinos and feel most Filipino when I'm with Americans. And at that point in time, I had no idea what being Filipino meant. So I applied for a Fulbright. And after I graduated college, which was in 1986, it was an amazing time. Every, all eyes were on the Philippines, democracy, people power. Uh, it was an incredible time to come back here. And instead of coming back home, I mean, back to the U.S., I just never left. You know, 1986 was pivotal for, my, for this country, for me as a person. And uh, I just wound up staying. I became a reporter. Again, kind of fell into it, but made me who I am. And I was still living in Manila when I remember Rappler starting and I'm seeing it on my social media, on my Facebook, and it was becoming what, sorry, my baby is crying in the background. I apologize. Um, <laughs> so I remember when Rappler started and took over as, you know, the best sources of news online. And, and I love that it's founded and led by women. And so I wanted to know how that came about how those decisions came up? Again, not by design. You know, it's funny, but uh, there are really no major gender issues in journalism in the Philippines because the major news groups were led, are led by women. And uh, Rappler is about 100 people now, but we're 63% women. The founders are all women. Uh, and it's, it is incredible. It means management is different. There is a different way of of moving the organization. I, I think it's more empathetic. Uh, and I also think that we couldn't have survived everything we had gone through if we didn't balance right brain, left brain, which women do very well. Not saying men don't, right? But I, this particular team is the best team I have ever worked with. And this is my... 34th year as a journalist. 
Um, and uh, I, this is also for you, Ramona, because like the characters in the documentary and the characters that you focus on, Ramona, in your oeuvre are predominantly women. And I want it like journalists. And then, of course, in the documentary, you have not just journalists who are women, but also the politicians who are running, who we follow. And I'm always astounded by the power of the Pinay. And I'm not saying it because we are Pinay all here, but like, I just wanted to get both of your opinions of why you feel or why, why you think that Filipino women are so fearless. Are so fearless. I mean, I can talk about why, you know, I, I don't think I ever consciously just cover Filipino. I never, well, except Journey, right? That's Arnell. But yes, all the other films are women because they're the ones that are, you know, you know in the way I film is very immersive, right? I really like move in. And I think women are more open to that than men, actually. Men are very, um, they're a little bit more guarded and it's harder to, um, uh, to penetrate, I, I think, um, and, and relaxed. Why are they fearless? I, I don't know, you know, um, I've been talking to someone about this because in, in light of the Asian American um, docu-series, right? And about being Asian American. You know, I, I grew up in Manila and about, so Maria and I are opposite, right? I, I spent my childhood in Manila, but my adulthood in the US. So, so when I came here, I didn't really know what Asian American meant. I didn't know all those like sort of microaggressions against Asians. I was naive actually, because it may have been happening. I'm sure they were happening, but I was naive because I came from a society where I was told I could do anything, right? That I could be anything, that uh, whatever you want, what do you want to do? Do that. So when I came here, it, it, it didn't occur to me that I couldn't do it, right? And I think those naive, that naive time really saved me because I think I would have been immobilized if I was aware, more aware. And I think I would, that would have leveled me, right? But because I wasn't totally aware of those microaggressions and the racism, I just went ahead and just did what I, what, um, I wanted to do. Like if I needed money for, I, I needed money for my films and I would ask what I needed, right? I would never ever make it less. You know, I always ask for what I, I wanted. I've never been um, afraid of the ask. I can do the ask pretty well. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm not sure I answered your question. Maria can answer this question. Because I've asked her this, right? We've talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> so culture, right? I, I think that uh, uh, Stanley Carno, who wrote this book about the Philippines in our image. He described the Philippines as uh, it's, it's a country that spent 350 years in a convent, Spanish colonial rule, and 50 years in Hollywood, uh, 50 years under the United States. We were a colony, the only colony, a protectorate of the United States. So we kind of had a history of uh, not fighting a revolution, that's the irony of it, right? And then look at the women. We grew up in a macho, we, wow. See how, how schizophrenic I can be. Filipino women grew <laughs> up in a culture where they have to uh, uh, work under the surface, right? Because although we've had a Filipino president, you look at every gender equality survey around the world, the Philippines ranks high, We've had two Filipina presidents, but yet uh, the first gender survey, and I think this was a survey that Rappler did in 2014 or 2015. Uh, we, we asked Filipinos, if you have equally, equally qualified people, a man and a woman, uh, who would you choose for a job? And 71% said they would choose a man. So why women? Women make things move without necessarily having to take the credit for it. We know this in many other countries around the world, right? The Eunice's network of financial, uh, his Grameen Bank was powered by women. The same thing. So I think uh, there's a, there's, there is a mentality that you just have to make it work. And it doesn't matter whether you get the credit or, or how the society looks at it. You've got to make it work. That is that is fascinating. Ramon, you want to add anything, or you want to? You're okay with? No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, it's so true. You just get on with it. You know, women just get on with it. You just do it, um, and no matter what happens, you just forge ahead. 
I think that's always been the attitude. And I, I do like, um, yeah, I do like making films about women. They're fun I, and, and they're uh, and uh, they're more complicated actually, right? Women are so complicated. That's why I like them. And they can articulate their complexity more than men. There's the scene, and I'm not going to spoil it for anybody who's going to watch it um, in the future, but there's a particular scene that takes place in a hotel room with you, Maria, and your sister, and you're packing your, your suitcase, and it's a very candid conversation with you and your sister, where, you know, it's almost like there's no camera, but like, obviously, there is a camera, and I wanted to know how, both for you, uh, Robota, and you, Maria, like, was it a point in time where you forgot, like, it was just... So you were so used to having a camera there that, you know, or Ramona, like, how did you, was that something you kind of prodded the sister to ask? I have no idea. I just wanted to ask because that scene made me cry. It was so, um, it was so wonderful. And um, the, emo as you said, a scene about women, complexity, et cetera. Um, I wanted to know what was going on there. So um, when I, I, when I film, I tend to film for long periods of time. It's very immersive, right? Um, and whenever I ask people, do you want to be in the film? You know, if they knew what I was asking, I don't think anyone would say yes, right? I wouldn't say yes to me. It's a crazy thing what I'm asking. So by the time that scene, we filmed that scene, it was, um, gosh, Mary, I think it was a year in or a year, a year in, right? Because I met her in 2018. I met Maria in 2018. That This was 2019 in the summer. So it had already been a year. We went through two arrests with Maria. We had traveled to New York with her. We went through the elections with her and all this craziness with her. So that seemed like easy, right? Her with her sister. It's 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 just like an easy shoot by then. Because yeah, so I yeah, so that came late. And that helps. That's that's a context. Um and um uh as far as me I never said it now, ever. But you know, I I I knew what her sister's concerns were. Let me put it that way. I knew she was concerned about Maria's safety. So um, yeah, so it was an easy, it was easy to go there with Michelle. Right, Maria? I don't know whether you were, were you talking about my sister, Michelle, who lives in the Philippines or my sister, Mary Jane, right? Both oh, of these. So uh, the, the quick answer to all of this is, you know, Ramona is dogged. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> She's very stubborn. You say no. She backs off a little bit and then she moves forward again. And this is after a year, right? So actually great traits for a reporter because a reporter should never take no for an answer, uh, except Ramona's time frame is like just so much longer than, than journalism. She moves it into a different field. And uh, with my sisters, you know, you know this, we have family scripts. Uh, so in many ways, by that point, they didn't exist for me. I mean, yeah, Ramona, you know, they were always there uh, in the background, but I'd gotten used to it. My sisters, we fell into a script, into our script with each other. My sisters, my family has always wanted me to dress more, you know, to dress. <laughs> me, I had a uniform from the time when I started reporting for CNN, black t-shirt, jacket, right? It's very, very simple because I don't. Steve, when Steve Jobs said this, I was like, oh yeah, that's that's me also. I don't ever want to think about what I'm wearing because there's so many things I need to really focus on. But having said that, uh, there were instances, those two scenes with my sisters. Um, Mary Jane, the one who's two years younger than I am, she was uh, concerned. She, and she's just really funny. And I think she made Ramona laugh, right? Uh, they were well, surprised never prepared by her. Yeah, you didn't prepare yeah, us because we're <laughs> we're really we're very different people, and I am a quiet person. I'm an introvert, uh, and you know that's how that was kind of my role in my family is to be the quiet person, just uh, reading a book in the corner, and then kind of piping up if we if if my parents ask something or my sisters and my brother ask something. My sister Michelle is kind of these two sisters take the spotlight, and. This is why I like being a reporter. I like being able to lurk and ask questions. Very similar to Ramona, except my sure. timetable is daily. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, that's that's amazing. So I'm going to go to a little bit more serious questions now. So um, a lot of the doc is about the Philippine information ecosystem and the weaponization of social media, along with the abuse of power. And so I want like for the people listening today, like, why is this so important for the U.S. to know right now? And like, because I know that there is a call uh, to action here. For both of you. Maria, Maria, Maria you can lead. Well, like. <laughs> I was, I was going, go, Ramona. I mean, for me, you know, it's, this is an existential moment. Uh, well, now, that was before coronavirus, right? Now that we have it, I think, on all fronts, now more than ever, you realize information is power. Information is power. It's the reason I became a journalist in the first place. And I think journalism is at this existential moment, even worse than before the pandemic hit. Uh, it we are we have lost our gatekeeping powers to technology. Technology has become an enabler of the rise of authoritarian leaders moving into dictatorships. We've certainly seen the erosion of our democracy in the Philippines in the last, it's been four years, four years since the first attacks on Rappler began. And it's exhausting. Uh, but at the same time, if our people do not do anything now, then, you know, we really do get the government we deserve. We need to, I always say this, and I've been saying this for four years, Rapplers hold the line. Because here, this is the line between protecting my rights guaranteed under the Constitution and the government's ability to barrel over it. Uh, I think more than ever, those lines have moved. And they've been enabled by technology because all over the world, cheap armies on social media are tearing down democracies. I thought before the pandemic that the 2020 was going to be the year when we hold technology accountable, where regulation or some kind of new system preventing lies laced with anger and hate from spreading faster than facts. That's that's insane. That's why the world is in the state that it's in. Well, now with coronavirus, uh, the social media platforms are taking action that they've never done before. They're taking down content. They're beginning to act like gatekeepers because during this time period, lies kill, right? So I'm hoping the upside of this lockdown, by the way, today begins the 10th week of a lockdown in Manila, right? Uh, I'm hoping that as we move forward out of here, that some of those actions that they take against disinformation networks of, of the pandemic will move into disinformation networks of political disinformation. This is a huge problem. And you ask why, why should Americans care? Because we're a testing ground. Our dystopia is your dystopia, right? I was gonna say it's your future, but you're already kind of in a dystopia right now. It's, <laughs> it's a very strange world where and I've said this, I feel like Alice in Wonderland, I fell into the rabbit hole and the Mad Hatter is in charge and I'm just trying to get out the other side. And I'm certain if gatekeepers come back to protect the public sphere, that that will happen. But, you know, we're waiting a little bit. This is it, act. So um, it was really interesting to sh screen the film at Sundance because we, we never make reference. We never... Uh, make this direct reference to what's happening here in the U.S. But a lot of the audience, mostly, you know, white audience, American audience, really got it, really got the parallels between the two countries without the film ever, ever saying it. We have only have one picture of Trump in Duterte, and that's it. We never mention him. Uh, but they did get, they did understand Mr. Formia. And the, the reason I wanted to make it is I wanted to, because I think we talk a lot about this information, but we don't really know how it starts, where it starts, what happens, right? And so this film tries to track it, like really explain what the hell it is, right? What is this information? As opposed to misinformation, this really uh, uh, lies, right? They're meant to be lies. They're not just misspeaking. They are meant to, you know, mislead. So that's why I wanted to make the film. Also in the backdrop of everything that's happening in the Philippines with the drug war and, um, and yeah, so, and freedom of the press. And that just happened to be because I think the first day of our production in the Philippines, Maria was arrested. So it just like, right? So it was just this roller coaster and suddenly, 
oh my goodness, this is a story. Sometimes you just, it just falls in your lap. And, you know, you both mentioned, I mean, like right now we are living with coronavirus and um, I, I keep in touch with my friends and family in the Philippines. And I know, you know, that citizens need papers to leave the house. You cannot travel from city to city. There are checkpoints. There's a liquor ban. There's a curfew. Is this a kind of martial law? Um, Maria, what do you think about this? Marie, you know, on May 5th, uh, the Philippine government shut down ABS-CBN, the largest network in the Philippines. It's as if, you know, it's like CBS getting shut down by the government or BBC in the UK getting shut down. Uh, it is the largest entertainment network. They have the largest stable of stars. Uh, directly or indirectly, they employ at least 11,000 people, right? They, there are 11,000 workers to, for this network. This is a death knell for press freedom. And uh, this happened at a time when the coronavirus, the pandemic conditions essentially mimicked uh, the curfew, the, the uh, barricades in each area as you move from one barangay to another. Um, it, it's declaring martial law without martial law, without declaring martial law, effectively, it's a de facto. Uh, but what's happened, uh, look, the last time ABS-CBN went black was in 1972, and it was followed by a 21-year rule of Ferdinand Marcos, a dictatorship, right? And now we're at this pivotal moment. Uh, it's, I, I think it's gotten even worse than what the film covers. This is, this is it. And uh, if nothing is done, we'll have a veneer of democracy but everything else has already been shifted. We've already given up the rights that are guaranteed in our Bill of Rights, which is our constitution is patterned after the United States. Um, look, uh, uh, I don't know where or when these restrictions are lifted. There are other parts of the Philippines where the quarantine restrictions have been lifted, but you know, I, this is the one country where if you violate the quarantine conditions. Our president has told the police and the military, and this is a direct quote, he said, shoot them dead, right? It's shocking to me, and ironically, so familiar now. And what I'm hoping is that Filipinos don't accept this, don't accept this as a normal, don't normalize the violence. Ramona? No, it's a tough time because um, I always say this pandemic is like a wet dream for authoritarians, right? Because you can't, everyone's in lockdown. You can't even protest, right? You can't, you're at home. You can protest online, but it's not the same. So you can really do anything under the guise, see it's still under this guise of legality, right? It all seems legal, which is even more egregious and it's scarier because they are using, they're weaponizing the law but they're doing it all under this legal terms. And he doesn't even have to declare martial law and it's ready, right? So it, it's, it's insidious, so it's scarier, I think. Yes, I'm, I'm happy you brought up uh, the closure of ABSU and that was my next question, but yes, it all is tied together and it is a very, it's a terrifying reality. Um, and it's something wherein um, if you, if you know, if you could say something that, I mean, there is, you know, we want people to be able to do something and not accept it as a norm. Is there anything else that you wish people would do if they would, if they did, if they were lost and they would, you want them to take your advice? What, what would you say? It's a tough time, right? Because as Filipinos begin to walk back out into the new world, uh, we're going to face an economy that will be devastated. And People will be afraid for themselves. You know, the fear is real this time. Uh, and they will be afraid of the government. Part of the reason uh, people haven't spoken up a lot more is because there are consequences to speaking up. I mean, I've been a journalist for a long time. This is the only time I've been arrested a few times, right? Uh, and I'm facing, you know, it's funny, Amal Clooney is, is the head of our international legal team. And every time she sends me an email that says, you know, we found more years that could cumulatively, 
you know, what the penalties that I could face. And her last count was uh, 103 years. I mean, why should I have to face a prison term? Why do I need to deal with these things, right? I sh the world has changed. But so here's the thing. Maybe Filipinos don't care about democracy, right? Look, I'm very emotional about this. Um, and that's the choice. You can't push people if they don't want it. All you can do is be who you are. Uh, do not let the the conditions, the society around you define your values. You should know who you are. And that's where it comes down to for me. Um, look, globally, the other thing is journalists are struggling with the difference between journalism and activism. My experiences in the last four years, I have seen firsthand how power is abused. I have had my rights abused. So in my mind, uh, and I would say this is um, for a lot of journalists, when there is a battle for truth, journalism is activism. There, that, um, there's an, a question from the audience that actually uh, ties in with what you're saying. Uh, Sybil Science, um, I'm sorry, Sybil, if I butchered your last name. Um, she's asking, is documentary filmmaking equivalent to journalism? And if not, what are the differences? <laughs> Oh boy. Um, I always say I'm a filmmaker and not a journalist, right? Um, what is the difference? I think, um, oh, oh gosh, I don't feel like I have to cover all sides in my uh, documentary filmmaking. And I gravitate towards stories that are um, experiential. So me, it's about experience, right? And I can really totally be in one person's point of view without having to feel like, okay, let's get the other side. And no, I never feel that way with my documentary film, with my documentary filmmaking. That's why I say I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not a journalist. It's a, it's a very clear difference in my head. I also make films that are not for television, right? I make theatrical docs. So I make the bigger, you know, the grander cinematic, uh, what are stories bigger than life stories. So I think that's a, that's a difference. That's the main difference. I don't feel the compunction to 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 get everyone's uh, point of view. That's not my job. Um, a lighter question from our audience, Patricio Hinel said the, um, the filmmaker, he's asking, do you have a favorite magic in the bottle moment captured during production that totally changed your direction of the entire film? Um, always, I mean, there's always a golden moment where you know you have a film, right? That always surprises you. You know then, okay, this is the right story to be telling. Because up until that moment, it's always, um, you're always trying to guess. It's very Zen. It's a very Zen-like filmmaking, right? Because you're in the moment, you think you have a story, you know intuitively, but there's always that one moment where you turn a corner and you know you have a story. And then you also have that one moment where you know, okay, we're done, we're finished. We're finished here. We can wrap. Um, and so, what were those moments for you for for a thousand cuts? For a thousand, oh my god! Oh, there were so many moments. Well, okay, we started the. the oh my god, we started production with Maria getting arrested, right? So you already know. Okay, here we go. But the difference with a thousand cuts for me was that I never cover breaking news, right? I'm not used to chasing breaking news. But Maria and Rappler, they were breaking news, so we had to fight the uh, news outlets constantly. Um, but we were always the first one in and the last one there, right? We just stay, right? We never leave because we don't have the deadline for the next day. Um, so that was, that was the difference for me because usually I like cover or filming people after the hubbub has already left, right? Oh, well, Arnell, you know, that was also lightning in a bottle. You know, it was while he was getting famous, but I usually like being alone in the in the space. So this was different. It was really, we weren't gonna, we were chasing. It was breaking news, but we had to transcend breaking news. So that was always a conversation with my DP and my son. We gotta transcend it. We're not doing breaking news, right? We're not doing reportage. That's not what I do. Um, so how do you do that when you are chasing breaking news? So it was, it, it was different, very different this time around. Um, Sybil has a follow-up question, which is about maintaining balance. How do you maintain balance with your subjects? What do you mean balance? How does she? I, get, I think um, she, in I guess I, when she 
um, Sybil's question has a parenthesis that says, especially with a figure like Imelda. So I guess, um, I'm not sure, I guess what you show, what you decide, because if she gives you hours of material, I guess you have a balance of, you know, no, I mean, what you sides of her. Point of view. And th this is the thing I'm saying, that's why I'm not a journalist, because you choose a point of view. And my clearly my point of view was Imelda, right? Whether you believed her or not, that's up to you, right? And, well, also you, I frame it in a certain way, but I had to stay clearly in her point of view because that was not, that was my chosen point of view in the film. You choose a point of view when, you know, when you're making a film and it's clearly hers, right? So balance was not my, uh, was not a concern for me, right? Because um, it's up to you whether you believe or not. She's a very, um, she, she's, not, um, she's not a dependable narrator and you know that, right? I mean, it's quite evident in the beginning of the film even because she talks about Irving Berlin writing a song for her. Really? Right? So I already, already there is a tinge of maybe it's not true. So it is up to the, to the audience to unpack that. So I wasn't, I, you know, that, that's, again, that's not my role as a filmmaker or my goal even. But I also feel like you're underselling yourself because in A Thousand Cuts, there is a beautiful balance there because you do cover Rappler, but at the same time, you see, you know, um, the political campaigning of Bato and as well as, you know, Mocha, Yuzon, and there, there are different sides in, to the story that you see. And I want a lot of people to see this film. So knowing that, you know, uh, film festivals aren't, um, there's going to be a, a weird, it's a weird thing this year. I want, how will people get to see this? Like, what is your distribution plan for a thousand? Uh, okay, so there is a distributor. We picked up a distributor out of Sundance. Um, it hasn't been announced, but we will be announcing in June. Um, uh, so it's still, um, it's not confidential. We, we've signed, but you will, it'll be uh, announced in June. Uh, we will have a theatrical um, in the summer, in August whatever that looks like, right? So it can be a mix of virtual theatrical screenings online, or maybe one theater in Los Angeles, one theater in New York, depending if they're open, or some drive-ins, or even talking about drive-ins, right? So, um, uh, so it's a mixture of that. That will be our theatrical screening in August. And before that, we will have a lot of moderated screenings, uh, moderated conversations, uh, possibly with Maria if she has the time. And then we'll show clips and talk about the film. We are also doing online, um, we're participating in Hot Docs and AFI Docs and Doc Edge in New Zealand. Um, uh, it'll be screened online and then we will have a talk back, a live talk back after. And, and then it'll be streamed after the theatrical in August, there'll be streaming, but it'll be geo-blocked. So I really, for me, it's important that the Philippines sees it. So we are trying to figure out that distribution plan and um, it has to be geo-blocked then to the Philippines. We'll, we'll, we'll see, we're figuring it out. But so by summer, by September, we'll be in uh, platforms. By November, it's broadcast, we'll be broadcast. And, and all this information will be on the official website and the yeah. Facebook page? Oh, you know. Yeah, you'll know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm just telling people so that they can stay tuned for especially oh, yeah. those who haven't. So yeah. a thousand cuts film.com is that the uh, a thousand cuts dot film that yeah there you go that's yeah. the for people who want to see it um I want to ask what you're working on next because do you choose your topics or do the topics choose you and this is a question from our favorite friend David Magdale David I always tease him you know Shit's Creek <laughs> David um <laughs> Like a, um, one of the characters calls her brother is David, and she has a certain way of saying David. David. Um, uh, sometimes it chooses me. Sometimes I choose it. Right. So I always have an idea, like a thousand cuts. To me, it was about Duterte. I needed to do something about Duterte. I did not know if it was about Maria. I, I, it, she was like, I met her in 2018. That's a story I should tell to close it out because it goes back to Imelda. Anyway, um, I didn't know, but then. Once we started shooting, it was so obvious she was a story, right? So it sort of chose me, but I already had the framework for what I wanted to do. Um, Ar Arnell, it was very specific. Um, and Motherland, I, I, I chased that. I, I chased that film because I, I knew I wanted to be in Fabella and stuff. So it, it depends. Um, Journey in a way, 
chose me because I was resistant to doing journey. But, um, you know, I just kept, kept coming back. And then it suddenly became a challenge because they told me no, right? They said, no, you don't have a story. I'm like, ah, just a minute. I have a, you have a story here. So the more you tell me no, I'm like, okay, let me prove to you you have a story. So it's, it's, uh, it's a combination. Sometimes it, uh, you know, it falls in my lap. Sometimes I chase it. So right now I am actually, so um, uh, Big Swing, Cura Sedgwick's production company has optioned Imelda uh, to remake. So I'm writing that script. So I'm finding that in lockdown, I'm able to write the script more. I, I've settled into this kind of schedule of writing a script. Um, and also um, Journey has been optioned by Warner Brothers and John Chu is directing. Crazy Rich Asians, John Chu is attached to direct and I am a producer and consultant in that. And uh, I'm developing a COVID-19 film, uh, a documentary uh, film having to do with uh, this global voice. Uh, 19 filmmakers from all over the world will film shorts for us, what's happening right in front of them. And then we're gonna weave it into this kind of omnibus collective film. So that is a, that's amazing. That's a lot. That's a lot of balls that you're juggling in, juggling in the air. I, I Mar like to do that yeah. because then it keeps me busy. Then I'm more productive when I'm busy. Otherwise, I'm not that productive. Maria, what are you working on right now? <laughs> you know, I think it, it's not. Rappler is always a work in progress, but I think that uh, we have to really look at. I guess I'm trying to wake people up even more, right? So does that make me an activist? Does that make me a journalist? Some of the things that Ramona has said is interesting to me because uh, the old idea of journalism, which is that you do both sides, there aren't just two sides for complex issues. And, some, and that kind of thinking has led us to the climate change deniers, right? Uh, so I think what you're seeing right now is really kind of a the creative destruction of so many things and trying to define that and then trying to sh to pave the way forward to think about what the world is going to look like post covid-19 because you journalism's form and, and substance is shifting it must it has to because we are facing these existential level issues uh, climate truth virus right and then uh, news organizations like rappler this COVID-19 is a pandemic. This pandemic is an extinction level event. Uh, we have to survive this. We have to find a new business model. And then this is my greatest fear, democracies around the world. Uh, extraordinary times need these extraordinary measures. We have given tremendous power to leaders all around the world. And you know, or I think Hungary is probably the worst because they've given the, these powers indefinitely to their leader. President Duterte has them. Um, and we need to reclaim these rights back if we're to remain a democracy. So trying to think, 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 think about, uh, and maybe it's not think, it's left brain, right brain. It's imagining what the world is going to be if we continue on this path. The path has been uh, jarred and shifted. And what will we create in that, in this new world? No pressure in this, uh, but, but there's actually a quite, if you could, if the world is burned down and you can make something out of the ashes, what do we want that world to look like? And that's, right. that's something that right. would be exciting to, to think about. And I'm excited to, to know what you end up with at the end of the day. Um, this has been an absolute, oh wait, I was going to wrap it up, but there's a question in here. Um, so, um, Peter Wong asks, what news outlets can Americans consult to get a truer picture of political events in the Philippines? Rappler, uh, aside from that, but, uh, but yes, uh, uh, what do you think, Maria? I think the major news groups have been covering us, the New York Times. Uh, New York Times is an interesting one because, you know, there, there was a debate. Their health reporter, uh, they kind of chastised their health reporter for speaking very bluntly on CNN with Christiana Manpour about how the United States, how President Trump has been handling the pandemic. And he wasn't speaking just as a, you know, it wasn't just his opinion. This is a man who is an expert at his field. Uh, sorry, I jumped into the debate, right? So uh, I would say your traditional news groups are still there. You have to go to, to places that have standards and ethics who debate these types of issues 
and then who will be transparent about how those decisions are made. And then I think the second thing is go and uh, get a very varied diet. Because you go back to this, get the facts. The interpretation of the facts may differ, right? Part of that is because of the social media platforms that have actually built by this polarity into the design of the social media platforms. They've splintered our societies apart even more. But I think if every one of us goes and finds the facts, hold on to the facts and make up your own mind, these time period really demands that of us today. Thank you. Um... Ramona, do you want to chime in of all the things that the where you decide to get your facts? Yeah. I'm from Rappler. <laughs> <laughs> Love you guys. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm liking the Atlantic. I'm liking the coverage of COVID. Um, they're doing amazing video work, by the way, in the Atlantic, if you haven't seen it, the shorts. Um, uh, Washington Post. Washington I, Post. Yeah. Yes. I like my show a lot. Um, and uh, um, Time. Yeah. What else? Yeah, but those are the two, my go-tos. And, uh, you know, New Yorker and the Paris Review. Not so much for that, just for, you know, good reading. But for the COVID um, coverage, it's Washpo and the Atlantic. I like the Atlantic a lot. Um, there's uh, one more question, and I'm sorry for going over, but I do feel like um, I'm very... Uh, happy that people are, are engaging and, and, and they want to know. Um, there is a question I don't, uh, there's no, I don't know who asked this question. It's an anonymous question, but they say, they said, when they mention Rappler to the older Filipinos or share a link from your site, they call it fake news. Is this because of colonial mentality or something else? Uh, I think it's something else. It isn't colonial mentality. Uh, part of the reason, so uh, two reasons right? Social media, Facebook is our internet here. And built into the design of social media is this idea that uh, it essentially pulls our society further apart. It builds polarity in. So if you're left or right in the U.S., if you're pro-Duterte or anti-Duterte, we may have started here. But then what happens when you create filter bubbles? Well, let's say the pro-Duterte moves further here, and then the anti duterte move further here. And they're all talking amongst themselves without hearing or seeing the other side. So they then splinter even further away from each other. And here is the public sphere debating the facts, right? So that's, that's the first. I think the second one is we have been the subject of intense propaganda attacks since 2016. Uh, and those, those, unfortunately, actually target the undecideds. It's an influence operation. It's a military uh, information operation, influence operations. And uh, some of that, some people really believe it. Depends on which account we read. It could still be part of the information operations. Twitter has taken down a whole bunch of new accounts that have uh, sprung up just uh, is it two weekends ago. Just last weekend, uh, ABS, CBN, and, and I were attacked by government accounts uh, where they were trying to make us uh, enemies of the state. And these government accounts were working with the military and the police. Uh, when I say enemies of the state, there's a phrase in the Philippines called red tagging, meaning that you're actually working for the Communist Party of the Philippines, which is illegal. And parts of it have been declared a terrorist organization. So, so this is ongoing. And I think what I, I would ask you do is go to our site, make up your own mind, look at the facts. I think one of the things we've succeeded in doing is moving forward as if we're not under attack, right? We will give you the news because precisely because when we look back a decade from now, we don't want to pull punches. We will hold power to account. And with that power full phrase. I feel that that is all the time we have for today. And um, I'm very happy for all the questions we've got for our audience. This has been a, a real dream for me to have a conversation with you two amazing, powerful women. And um, um, I, I would love... Um, I want to uh, invite our audience to please check out the rest of the showcase lineup from the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival next Saturday at this time. So May 23rd, same uh, 5 p.m. PST, 8 p.m. EST and 8 a.m. Philippine time where Maria is. 
we're presenting Lumpia, the amazing classic film, along with a Q&A with the filmmakers in preparation for the long-awaited release of Lumpia 2. Please follow Cinema Sala. We're on Instagram at cinema underscore Sala and on Facebook. And I hope you'll join us for Monday Night VC House It, where we celebrate Linda Mabalat, her, resi her resilient leadership, political savvy, and commitment to multicultural collaboration. You can watch all the short films now before the Monday evening conversation. And for more information on visual communications, please check out the website, vcmedia.org. I'm um, thank you so much. Um, I cannot, everybody please watch a thousand cuts. It's one of the best things you'll watch all year. Um, you might, I mean, I, you know, I was crying and I was, it's all, and I was also I had to acknowledge the terrifying world that we live in now and am also inspired into action. And so thank you. Please continue doing the amazing work that you're doing in society um, and in the world. And it's uh, been a great evening and goodbye. Thanks, Marie. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Marie. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good morning. Bye-bye.